All right. Yo, fam, I feel like this has been long overdue, fam. Yeah, man, it's been a minute. I can't remember how long it was uh, that we did the last interview. You are part of the original, I feel like, first 10 to 20 episode alumni, bro. <laughs> nice. um, I didn't even know. I thought you were doing it deep but back then, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm blessed <laughs> to know that. Yo, like. And the thing is that that's tragic, right? And I'm already recording. We just, I just kind of do like a rolling intro. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, what's tragic is back then I had no production skills. You know what I'm saying? So it, it still looked very professional, brother. Trust me, because I think you're doing it at that. Uh, I don't know if it was a vape shop or yes. something like that. The Borough Head Lounge. Yeah. Salute always, to them, man. Smoking the air always looks good, you know. That, that was a vibe still. That was a vibe, man. Yeah. But like, I, I'm really, really happy to be able to do this with this, this, this interview with you. I don't even want to call it an interview. I want to call it a conversation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find some tunes here to, to really get us into the vibe here. Yeah. Which one? Money or? I, it was money. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. I haven't seen this thing in a long time. <laughs> yeah. I seen one of them too. I was, I was somewhere in a Kensington this Part in the parking lot. This parking yeah. lot. Or yeah. No, fam. It, it was it was legendary times, and it's good because I'm speaking to a legendary gentleman who not only came from those legendary times, but continues continues to move the culture forward. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm not even gonna do the whole super long intro, okay? Because the people in the viewing audience already know what it is. <laughs> okay, we got JB in the motherfucking building. You know what I'm no saying? GCP Fleming and Park all day. Yo, fam. Keep it moving. Thank you for coming through, bro. Hip-hop, hip-hop. Respect, brother, for always having me. You don't know. Yo, fam. Last time I seen you, there was a couple of shows that were going on. Um, there was the Brass Tack show. Yep, I think yeah. that was the last time. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So even with that, because like it's been like two years of nobody going outside and stuff like that. Yeah. What was that like? Just jumping up on the stage. You had your son with you, Sue Takaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it, was, it was pretty cool. That was uh, the first time that I've ever been on stage with my son, actually. Him and really? Like, just doing the backup. So it was good energy. Okay. And then we didn't rehearse that or nothing. It was just kind of natural. Mm-hmm. But yeah, shout out to Brass Tax, Eyes, Cat, you know, the whole team. Uh, Vibe 105, I believe, is the ones that helped put that on. Yeah. And a shout out to the guys at the Phoenix Concert Theater. Mm-hmm. I, I always love performing on big stages. It's kind of like what what I thrive on. And I'm, I got spoiled early doing stadiums and shit like that. So <laughs> that's all I want to do. Yeah. Um, but it, it was a little different. I guess people probably were a little bit fearful to come outside. You know, everyone's feeling has their different opinions and mm-hmm. their different feelings on what's going on is with, during this pandemic. But it was good to see people come out. And it was it was like um, going to the gym after a long time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was a great workout. Yeah, and it's like riding a bike, as they say. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. And even like with with you, like I feel like as an artist, this the and, and a businessman, there's a couple of different things I want to get into. You know how usually with artists, I'm like, you know, how are things going, but I want to know how things are going and how's business. Right, because you got the, yeah. the the hat on from one of the brands that you that you actually deal with. no 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 this is just a regular hat. Okay, I thought that was a Homer's. I know hat. I have it because it's H, mm. and everything I usually do is going to have the H on the H crown. Mm-hmm. That's our Homer's premium lager that's been available in the LCBO now for over six years. Talk about it, scene, and uh, I think during our first interview, we you know we displayed that as yes, well. Yes, yes. So respect, but yes, yeah, so all across LCBO, across Ontario. Um, Things like that. I've, you know, been helping to develop other artists and consulting with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to all the young artists coming out of Canada, out of Toronto right now. is killing it right now. I mm-hmm. love seeing all the artists out of Toronto right now. The energy is amazing. Um, but things are good. You know, a lot of kids trying to do a lot of things, a lot of ambition. You know, sometimes it brings on stress and then, um, uncertainty. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm a risk taker. And, you know, for those of for, for those of y'all out there that are risk takers, you know, it's always good to just never give up and always try. You never know until you try is how I, how I live my life. Yeah. And anything I could think of and dream of, I'm always going to try and accomplish it, you know? So I've been doing some cool things. Going to get back into the chicken and waffle soon, I hope. Okay. And, you know, get into the, into the cannabis space right now as well. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, with Zen Cannabis. So look out mm-hmm. for Zen Cannabis wherever you are. Kitchener, Toronto. Jane Street in Toronto at the bottom by Bloor. Yeah. The Kitchener, it's over at Victoria Street by Lancaster. You know what I'm saying? And we trying to, you know, just 
just grow and just, you know, I'm just getting into all of this stuff with hopes and dreams and mm -hmm. hoping that I could be one of the people that, you know, end up being successful from this to be able to create opportunities for others and, you know, stimulate minds and give other people ambition to want to do the same. You know, yeah. so we have more black entrepreneurs out here. Um, and this fucking fly is going to kill me today. Yeah. One thing also, even when you were speaking about black entrepreneurship and stuff, right? Are you one of many mans in your, in your, in your team or the people that you came up with who are into this or, or you're just one of, one of many? You know, that's, that's the first time I've ever been asked that. Um, my father is a, is a businessman. He owns, you know, a contracting company. I've always seen him hire people mm -hmm. and run like construction and different things like that. Um, people around me, we all just kind of came up together and everybody yeah. was just doing whatever they were doing. Yeah. But nobody was really into business. And I've seen some people, you know, like a one man might have a, a, a spot on Eglinton West with a, with a bowl of soup on the, on the stove. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? But nothing really that it was like, it's a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's no like waitresses and stuff like that. So I've never seen people operate and run businesses. Yeah. Like that other than people that like my father and maybe local business people that were in Fleming Park, like, mm -hmm. you know, the person that owned the restaurant that, you know, that you're going to every day yeah. you know, in conversation, seeing what they're doing, admiring what they're doing. But I have a lot of great people around me uh, from Flemo. One of my, one of my biggest, um, um, inspirations or people that I look up to is Michael Coteau. He's like a po politician here. He's, okay. He almost became the lead, lead of the Liberal Party. Nice. Um, after Kathleen Wynne. But um, now he's one of the only ones left. He's a black man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he does a lot. He's, he's handled the Pan Am games. He's raised the minimum wage. And he's people, he's some of the people that just kind of give me conversation I have other people as well that are from big organized, uh, big, you know, companies or corporations that lend me their time. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate. Sometimes I, I, I look at my son, I say, I don't know why these people even talk to me. I said, they must be sent from somewhere else because they don't have no reason to even be around me, to even utter any breath out of the mouth around me. Yeah. The level or the things that the accomplishments that they've been doing or the life that they live. But they seem to, you know, give me attention sometimes to allow me to, better myself in conversation with them and them teaching me how to do things better or, you know, maybe little tricks of how to get things accomplished. Mm -hmm. And it gives me inspiration. I guess they say, you know, it's about the people you're around. Yeah. So I try to stay around people that are definitely not from any walk of life that I'm used to mm -hmm. that push me to have and accomplish things that I admire about them. Yeah. And I'm around people that, you know, these guys are buying islands and stuff like that. You know, it's like this crazy shit. I'm just like, Some Shark Tank motherfuckers. Like, yeah, I see yeah. you in five years. I ain't even going to even jump into that. Even yeah. entertain you. You know what I'm saying? But these guys are doing things like that. And, you know, I'm I'm blessed to be around some great people. You know, shout out to Jason Singh. Mm -hmm. You know, he's also responsible for um, managing Tizzy Stacks. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And Tizzy's had a lot of great accomplishments in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. You know, he's helping help consult to get Kaka signed to Artistry Music Group yeah. over there in, in, uh, in Atlanta and in, in the States there. Mm -hmm. And shout out to Max Goose and those guys. You know, we're still waiting to see what's happening. And it's nothing where it's a big deal where, but we're just trying to still develop the artists, yeah. you know, to give these kids an opportunity. Like what you see, we develop Jazz Cartier here mm -hmm. and with the success that he's had, you know what I'm saying? So we're trying to just continue that and anything that we touch, we want to be, you know, some of the innovators of the next generation of the stars of, mm -hmm. of Canada, you know, internationally. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I try to do a lot of things. That was a long answer for all of that, but there's a lot of stuff going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, definitely. And and yeah. I, I I don't think it's a long answer. I I appreciate the, the the jewel that you're dropping right now, man. And even with um going back a little bit, right? Yeah. You know, actually, before we go back, I I have some more questions about business because right, let's go. I feel like there's obstacles that come when it comes to being a black man in business. Yeah, right. Definitely. Now, can you give us an example of sometimes? of some businesses that didn't work that you tried? Cause you have yeah. some that are working now, but we all have, we all have to take L's to get the W's. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Everything is always, never always working. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. we're always constantly trying to keep it working and keep it afloat and keep it going. Mm -hmm. A lot of things look a lot nicer on Instagram or 
you know what I'm saying? On um, picture with, yeah. that's polished and in real life, they don't see, you know, the calls to LCBO or to anything else that anybody else may be doing mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. the grind about it, right? Um, I'm good. Okay. But yeah, so nobody, nobody really sees the grind. They just see what you display. Yeah. So they don't see all the, all the disappointment and all the rejection that you get, right? Mm. So one thing, one of the biggest things for me as like, basically I'm a salesman. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A natural salesman, right? But that's what I led into with all these businesses. It's yeah. still sales, right? But the biggest thing is getting getting rejection from mm. somebody that has no care. No, they don't care who you are, what you're doing, or what your business is. Yeah. They don't want to mess with it, and they'll tell you whatever they don't like about it. Yeah. And it's just getting that rejection with a smile on your face because you can't get angry in the business that you need to keep compliance. You know what I'm saying? So there's different levels of different businesses that you're doing that you got to keep compliance because you got to keep your licenses in order to do those businesses. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm glad you dropped that jewel. Yeah. Like keeping the composure in, in the rejection, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times, and especially to add that extra layer of us that come from the hood and stuff like that, you know, we'll be like, yo, man's dissing and like, right. want to, you know, take it the wrong way and do the wrong thing. And now the bridge is burnt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, have you ever had that happen and have to learn from that mistake or most, have you yeah, always known? But a lot of times, you know, I've tried to do a lot of things in my life and a lot of times things don't go the way I like mm-hmm. or that I planned and I just got to figure it out afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, you can hear me good in the mic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just got to figure things out afterwards. But, you know, I learned the hard way to just do things the right way mm-hmm. and then have somebody to confide in or just complain about it afterwards. Yeah. 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 You know what I'm saying? Cause anything that's going to happen in that moment ain't going to really benefit you. Nothing really, unless you're really a threatened, if you're in danger or something like that, people mm-hmm. are getting aggressive, then you got to kind of defend yourself. But yeah. if it's just, you know, trying to get something out of somebody or trying to get something across, that's not coming across. You just got to go around them or find another way, mm-hmm. you know? And that's why I say, you know, you never know till you try and then never leave, everything with one person that gives you a, a, a reply or, a, or an answer, mm-hmm. find out if there's somebody else or another company or, you know, another route that you could take to yeah. go around that to see if you can still accomplish that. If you're really serious about getting what you want to get done, done. That's game right there. Yeah. So, so now let's go back, right? Flemington park. Right. Um, have you always like grew up there or, or like, did you move there from like young, young and then start your life over there? Yeah, so Fleming Dunn Park, because uh, Fleming Dunn Park is technically jungle, right? Mm-hmm. So Fleming Dunn Park, Don Mills and Eglinton is where I grew up. Um, I was actually, you know, um, I think when I was first born, my parents came here from Jamaica. My mom was from Jamaica. My dad came here from Trinidad. They were both teenagers at the time. Yeah. Um, one went to Eastern Commerce, one went to Danforth Tech. You know what I'm saying? My mom and her sisters, them were probably some hot girls back in the day, so... Mm-hmm. You know, that was a close proximity between Danforth and, and Eastern now, still to this day anyways. Yeah. And so they met, they had me. So I was a product of teenage parents mm-hmm. that were new immigrants to Canada that like most of our parents around my age and, you know, our age. Yeah. And um, they were living on like Danforth or like uh, Gerard or something like those areas. Like okay. East York. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, they got a, probably an apartment. Um, I grew up, um, um, the, the St. Dennis building there in Fleming and park across from the science center. Yeah. I know. Right. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah. that's where I, that's where I grew up. A lot of people from Flemo may be from Vendome or Grenoble or different places, mm-hmm. different size, South side, H block. But I grew up right over there. We call that H block. After it was named H Block, but so that's where I'm from, like that side there. Mm-hmm. And it was it was a dope experience growing up growing up in Fleming uh, Fleming and Park. It was during the crack epidemic, so yeah, that's the '80s time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So on the Vendome side, a lot of crazy shit was going on, but over my side, it was pretty pretty quiet. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just playing ball. A lot of my uncles were were teenagers at the time as well. Yeah, from the Homer side, and that's where the Homer's Premium Lager and everything come from. Boom. That's my actual last name. And, you know, it was a dope, it was a dope childhood. Yeah. I can't lie, you know, coming out to seeing man them break dancing, you know what I'm saying? Seeing mm-hmm. man them rapping and stuff. It blew my mind. You know, I would watch TV and I would see the same stuff that mm-hmm. I was watching TV, seeing on my own block, you know? And at that time we were like a significant 
block that was like comparable to Brooklyn and different places. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because even like when I drive past the area and I've been in through the area a couple of times, like more than a couple of times, right? Yeah. It's like a maze. Can you yeah. explain for the person who's like, let's say outside of Toronto or even just outside of that area, like yeah. what, what that is like? Cause it's like a few buildings and. So what's, what's, what's dope is I actually did the documentary. Um, we did the uh, GCP recording corp, mm-hmm. did the music score for the official documentary of Fleming and Park. Oh. Okay. Shout out to our sponsors, Astro Pink, always coming with that loud, loud. Check them out on their website, myastropink.com, or you can hit them up on Instagram at Astro underscore Pink. If you know, you know. Okay. Right. The most multicultural place on planet Earth. Yeah. Um, sorry, I forgot homeboy's name that did it. Um, it was an Indian guy. Very cool guy. Um, I'm going to remember the name, or you can pull it up anyways. They still play it on TVO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they could probably find it online. I'm going I'm to I'm yeah. cut it right in. So a couple of our, a couple of the GCP guys acted in it. Um, and then what I learned about it, though, is so Fleming Park was the ex-army base. Vendome was the army base. Mm-hmm. So Fleming Park was who knows whatever all, you know, what else was going on, what else was going on over there. Because Thorncliffe Park was an actual racetrack at the time, and that's just across the bridge. Yeah. So there's probably a lot thriving back prior to the 50s. So these Jewish brothers came and they, they developed um, the plans from Europe. And that's how they did all of the uh, neighborhoods that we know now mm. in Toronto. So all the, the townhouse complexes from Jane Street to, to the Etobicoke to downtown and Regent Park to Fleming and Park, mm-hmm. they're all based off of European design. So probably if we go some places in Europe, we're probably going to say the exact same layouts yeah. for townhouses built for middle-class citizens. That's why most of the townhouses in the hood in our city look amazing. If you look at it from a standpoint, like it's a townhouse, yeah. sunken living rooms, you know what I'm saying? Walkouts to dr- to the uh, basement garages and, and stuff for most of them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it was middle-class for middle-class citizens. And then when most of the immigrants started coming into Toronto, they started, the government started subletting those or giving those to the, to the immigrants. Mm-hmm. And most of the people that lived there started moving abroad, Scarboroughs, okay. Marlboroughs, whatever it was, if it's uh, Maltons, whatever. Yeah. Right. So that's how it was set up. So that's Fleming and Park. See? So when I grew up in Fleming Park in the 80s, 90s, I guess when the full-fledged, you know, the crap epidemic was there. Yeah. But whatever was happening in the States was spilling over here. And a lot of the guys, when I was a youth, were used to go over across to New York all the time to go whatever they're doing, to go shop or whatever. But it used to be like a weekly thing almost, right? Yeah. And it used to be, a, it was just dope. When I watch stuff, like I seen the new Wu-Tang series and I see some of these movies from like old school New York and it reminds me of growing up in Flemo. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We had a lot of guys there. There's a lot of different sides. There's in our time too, there's a roots man. And then there is like just the regular hip hop B boys. Yeah. You know and those two didn't cross most of the time. Okay. You know, unless you're going to a party that was in the hood that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That everyone's just going to the party anyways. But yeah. They used to call the, I remember some of the, you know, roots man used to call the hip hop guys, funky boy, whatever. Cause it was basically, Mainly like maybe a turf war type mm. of situation because everybody just wanted to make the most money. Yeah. And, you know, music back then was a little bit divided. You know what I'm saying? Even though, you know, it would seem like reggae and hip hop were one, but it wasn't even though one came from the other. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was that's, interesting. That, that's, it. that's very interesting. I'm wondering if it was like, because this is a, this city is very Jamaican influence, right? It, one yeah. of the, the most amount of the people that come from the Caribbean, the biggest percentage are people who come from Jamaica, yeah. right? So do you think that there was like a, a betrayal factor? Like the, the, the Roots man's felt that, you know, you guys were betraying, or the guys who were into hip hop were betraying Jamaican culture and like moving to the American culture? So funny that you even said it like that, because what I'm thinking as well is that it was so fresh mm-hmm. back then too. Hip hop yeah. was new. Reggae at that, like the 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 aggressive reggae was new. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the everyone's in the new feelings. Yeah. But they're all West Indian at the end of the day. Yeah. From the same places. That's what I'm thinking. See, so it's like, <laughs> it's kind of like it was like that. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's like, yeah, they, I, 
it was and it was pretty aggressive. But yeah, so and again, it, back then too, there's a lot of unity, but mm-hmm. everybody most of the time and most of the turfs that we know or grew up, everybody was individual, especially if you're a West Indian. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's the baddest man to themselves. You know what I'm saying? Until yeah. there's just one guy that's not even really a bad man, but just leads leads the pack. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it was just kind of like that energy back then. It was just it was new and it was just it was it was heavy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Early 90s, you know what I'm saying? Mans used to walk up on turf with all kinds of crazy stuff, like out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just it'd be madness because it's crazy. We're all we're in these communities that were kind of like sheltered from everywhere else around the world. No one could see in it. Mm-hmm. There's all kind of crazy stuff happening. And this is pre-Instagram too. So it's like, yeah, yeah, ain't yeah. nobody could even know the tales, man. No, That's crazy. You just hear someone wake up in the morning and say, what was that happening last night? <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? Man, I'm just ringing off, just having fun or something. But That's crazy. But yeah. So even with you, like, did you have like a full household? You know, you, you, you mentioned your yeah. pops. So mom and pops are there. Did you have like a whole bunch of brothers and sisters? Yeah, so after a time, I ended up getting a lot of brothers and then one sister from my mom's side. And mm-hmm. then my mom had, well, my father had a couple other um, brothers and a sister for me. So I got like five brothers, two sisters, I believe. Okay. But growing up, um, it was like, I got one full brother. We grew up in Flemmo and then the rest of them kind of grew up in Scarborough because mm-hmm. they moved out at that point. And um, at the first place I moved actually out of Fleming Park was to Driftwood. And I remember my mom said, yeah, we're moving out of the apartment. We got a house. And she made it this big deal that there was a house. And it was a house like, I remember it was like 396 Driftwood or something, like right in the heart of the hood. Like right there. I remember the first day I went there, like somebody got stabbed with some ambulance. Or something <laughs> Yo. Like, right? So it was just crazy. But from then, I still, I was so dedicated. I was in grade seven. I remember I took the bus every day and went down to Fleming Park from Driftwood. Wow. So nobody, anybody in Finch probably never even wouldn't even know that I lived there for two, three years. And I was right there in the hood on the go to, to the, to the convenience store across the local bridge mm-hmm. on, in Driftwood there and always be there and then in and out, but I wouldn't be hanging out. I'd just be like literally a walk in the back. Yeah. And then I'd just be on the bus and then back down to Flemo. Right? That's interesting. And like, you know what, before I even continue with the history, I want to stop right there for a second and just like jump off into, um, something that has come up on the podcast before, like that allegiance to hoods out here, yeah. right? Like you're talking about that dedication of like going back from all the way from Jane back down to the East end. You know what I'm saying? Why is it that Toronto and not just Toronto, but like multiple hoods in the States and stuff like that, people like have such an allegiance to their hood. So I feel like for me personally, and this could kind of like relate to a couple of different things is I felt like I was a part of something mm-hmm. and being there was probably like in a dumb way of saying it, like a simple way of saying it is like being there for practice, mm-hmm. for rehearsal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's kind of like you're a dedicated person of a team. You're always there in the gym. You're always on the court. You're always on the field. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I was super dedicated. Anybody that know me, know me. I was all in, no matter what I do. And I'll be the first one to dive right in to anything, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that's what maybe kind of like um, capturing the minds of other young people that feel like it's so cool. And especially now with social media, I can't imagine like the amount of like false um sense of 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 popping or whatever thinks that they they got you know because maybe some likes like back in the day you know what i'm saying you that may have a chain on or something that you hustle hard to get or something and then some girls like it at some club that you went to or something mm-hmm. and you get two numbers or something but you know now like it's just a picture so i can't imagine what their their idea of what's popping and who's popular around them and why yeah. they want to be around that person so much but hopefully, you know, people get their individual minds. I'll say that one thing that, you know, growing up in Flemma, everybody was individual and we just came together as brotherhood mm-hmm. at the end of the day and kind of defended each other if it was defendable for whatever reasons. That's more like, you know, schoolhead friends type of thing. Like you get jumped, I'm going to jump in. Which yeah, yeah. It wasn't, you know, but. Yeah, I think, you know, people are just kind of getting caught up in different things. And hopefully, you know, I try to teach my kids. I got a lot now and a lot of them are 
you know, getting older. Stay that, a bit you closer know, to the mic. Sorry. I try to teach them to just, you know, be individual and be the leader, if anything, and mm-hmm. don't follow nobody. Yeah. No, fam. Like, I, that's, I just wanted to know that because I see it so much. With hip hop as our culture, right? Yeah. You know, we always ball out our hoods. Like, you know, you, you, you ball out Flemo. I'm balling out Parkdale. Like yeah. we all like, we, we rep, we rep our hoods so hard. And I always wonder like, what's the reason? Like when we're young, like where we, where we get that from, you know what I'm saying? Right. And what's interesting is I had a conversation. My homie called me, same politician. I was telling you, uh, Michael Cotto, mm-hmm. you know, y'all, whenever you see him go support, man, he's really for the people and he's for us. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. He's from the hood. And he represents, he was actually MPP of Don Valley East for many years as well. So what we were talking about is we said, because I told him, because I feel at this point in my life, and I'll say this straight, I feel like I, my life has almost been sabotaged mm-hmm. because my mind and my bloodline is from such greatness and such great minds mm-hmm. and great business and technology and engineering minds that we grew up in a culture that hip hop made us feel like we had to do certain things and live a certain lifestyle in yeah. order to be popular if you want to be popular. Mm-hmm. And it was hard and it may, see sim- may seem simple to some people to out from the outside to say, why don't you just get a job or whatever? But it takes a lot to get those positions of power that, you know, um, when you're an in- individual doing your own thing, you're your own boss because whatever was in your hands at that point and you're doing whatever you're doing to make money, you're doing it yourself, mm-hmm. you know, individually, regardless of who you got to get, everybody got to get from a wholesale supply store somewhere doing whatever they're doing or whatever legitimate businesses that they're doing out there. Everybody got to eat. Yeah. So I feel like all my life, everything that I've done, whatever I've done, which may be nothing, maybe a lot, depending on who you ask, you know what I'm saying? That, Anything that I've done that wasn't up until this point now. And for people out there that are living like, you know, doing whatever, like have a plan at least, I'll say. Yeah. And set up at least your own like health plan at least or yeah. some vacation time or something like that. Because, you know, people that do other things, they get bonuses. They get all kinds of stuff for all that hard work and effort that they do. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And nothing ever is perfect. And things go left, right, up and down. But at least be protected in everything that you're doing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times growing up, especially from the 80s and the 90s, and, and people from all the turfs and all the hoods all over, all over the city and all over the world, really, you're doing shit for other people. And that person may be doing shit for other people. And then that chain keeps on going. Yeah. And at the end of the day, no one's really looking out for you because once anything is fucked up, and nobody's looking for nothing except for their money back. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And there's no bonuses and things and perks that come with that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's yeah. no there's no um, college funds. There's no pension. There's no pensions so that if you get old or shot or, you know what I'm saying, something happens to you that there's a, there's, you know, this uh, 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 street pension that's going to allow health, you. A health care plan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To pay for your rent yeah. and not have to do things that you thought you didn't want to do. Yeah. And now you feel like shit because you have to do forcefully. Because you ain't popping or things ain't going the way it planned or niggas ain't fucking with you or yeah. you just don't have that hustle ethic and you know more because years catch up on you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And those Spirit are real things. You know what I'm saying? So those are things I'm hoping that the new generation kind of <coughs> sees ahead of time and corrects, you know, because mm-hmm. that's unfortunate that, you know, the imagine, imagine the sickest you from the from the whatever, the grimiest turf doing the most amount of work, doing whatever they're doing. And then they go inside for a year, they come out and they just feel different, but they don't want to do it no more. Don't mean to say that they didn't do all that work and nothing's there for them now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a double-edged sword when it comes to that. You You know know what what I mean? So we we can, we can unhatch a whole other thing because there's the whole moral and legal and all that type of stuff. You know what I mean? And yeah, moral, moral compass will catch you sometime. You know Mm -hmm, what I'm saying? mm -hmm. Um, but let me ask you. Yeah. Like to even get to the music part of stuff, right? Yeah. Guilty crime, guilty um, crime productions. Yeah. How did that start? Because I went to school with one of the gentlemen 
I went to Harris back in the days in yeah. 97 and I, and he gave me the CD and it had mad niggas on the cover, fam. Yeah, so that was a turf's hot. Yeah. So GCP was like before me again. It was just from like the 80s, 90s. GCP was just Guilty Crime Posse, mm-hmm. the crew of B-Boys that was from Fleming and Park. Right. You know, Fleming and Park prides, everybody prides himself to be the flyest nigga. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that, that group of B-Boys was GCP. You know, it was dubbed by Bunky B. He's the one that looked at them and I said, yo, y'all niggas are GCP, guilty crime posse. You know, mm. big up Bunky B. He's actually the one acting in the Fleming and Park documentary as well. Okay. And um, I came in a lot later. I was a youth. I came up. Those guys were older for me. I went to school with my homie Mark. His older brother was one of the GCP guys. And I remember I was just starting out trying to rap, trying to do everything. And I was super hungry. And those they were just the older guys. And they weren't even doing music. Mm. I just wanted to be on the turf and hang out. Yeah. And be allowed because that you would have to, back then you would have to be allowed to do certain things. Yeah. And I would have to allow you to be around them or whatever. And, you know, I remember I did something, I had a fight in school or something. And then one of the other GCP guys kind of put his arm around me. He's like, yo, this is my boy. Da, 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 Cause I won the fight or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was like a guy two grades older than me, you know? And that's how it started for me. I was in grade four and knocked out a grade six guy yeah all the other gcp guys were mainly in grade six grade seven so that made them think that i was just like this bionic you probably that mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. they was knocking out all the niggas yeah. out there and there, i remember my my friend came to me like yo i heard my my brother's friends talking they wondered if they could beat you up they're not sure <laughs> if they're stronger than you or not da, da, da. right and then i always kind of got a little bit of love from that and then we in Grenoble, that was our public school in Flemo, we said GDP, Grenoble mm. no posse. You know what I'm saying? To kind of follow the older guys. Yeah. So we're always kind of one step behind, just kind of looking up to them. And, you know, one day I was a, probably, I was 16 years old. And I remember we're just out there. And it was at that point that I was outside now with the band and they accepted me. You know, I earned my stripes or whatever. And I say, yo, I want to use this for music. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And then Bunky B and them and then Chico and I'm like, yo, use that for the music. Da, da, da. And I remember I said, I called Guilty Crown Productions. You know what I'm saying? And then because I was so eager, I was doing music. Yeah. And State of Mind was popping now at this time. Mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I was already doing music as a youth from Too Young to Handle. Okay. People don't know about that. I perform at Live at the BBQs, okay. all of that shit. See? See? And I was a hungry this. youth. Yeah, you know? I didn't know this mind yeah. myself. Yeah. I perform at O'Keefe Center back in the day, Mel Lastman Square, mm-hmm. big stages. And that's when, at a time when Thrust was just coming up. Yeah. I was that little kid that was 12 years old that was rapping that people are wondering who are these little kids uh, that they let on this stage. You know what I'm saying? So I was always doing that and that's courtesy of S Blank. S okay. Blank's the one that produced for Maestro, produced for a lot of other artists coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yes, right? to S Blank. Yeah. And, uh, he was partners with uh, Gels, Chris Scott Rocks, mm-hmm. you know, back when those guys were coming up with, with uh, uh, Self Defense. Yeah. So it was really him that kind of allowed me to do music. I got older, those guys kind of dissolved what they were doing. So I couldn't tag along no more with them because mm-hmm. I used to tag along with self-defense all the time after that. Yeah. When I was 12. And I remember to get with self-defense, I had to rap for S Blank on a telephone with my homie Robbie D. <laughs> See, and I had to beg him to call his big brother so that I could rap to them because I used to know that some of the rappers were coming into the park. Yeah. Right. And then I used to see, I used to feel that and see that. So I wanted to be a part of that. And that's how I got through. Like he put me on the phone with him. He's like, yo, my brother, he picked up. And I remember he goes, a rap, my, he goes, my you rap or whatever. And then I just rap my ass off over the, the phone. over the phone. <laughs> Fleming and Park Plaza, you know what I'm saying? When they used to have the beer store in it. On the, at the pay phone? At the pay phone, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yo, that's some hip hop shit, bro. Yeah, bro. <laughs> like, I remember that shit too. That's crazy. So, you know, they let me w- hang with them and be, you know, in the rehearsal spaces and go to performances. And then they would tag me on to any performances that they were doing, they would say, yo, these youths are rapping now. And I remember I'd have to, I would have to like bother some of my friends to just make sure they showed up to rehearsals and different things like Mm -hmm. that. So that, you know, we could be a part of whatever they were doing. Hold on. At 12? 12, 12 years old, bro. Yo, you wanted it that bad that back then, eh? Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you who could witness this, who used to be in there hungry as well. And I'll give them credit, man is uh, Danny O mm. and those guys, uh, Monolith. 
Yeah. Because they used to be, when S Blank moved to Markham, I remember I used to go down there and this little light skinned kid used to be down there. And we're always hungry and grimy from Flemmo. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to always just, you know what I'm saying, compete with anybody and yeah. everybody. You know what I'm saying? So I remember I was like, oh, these guys are rappers, da da da. I used to compete with like, um, ABC and all those kids from America too. You know okay. what I'm saying? And when Frankie and I those know the guys, creation. I know, you know, when those guys came up with, you know, um, TBTBT. TBTBT, yeah. Cause we used to be called Too Young to Handle mm. from Flemmo. And they were too bad to be true. You see? So we're always very competitive, but we yeah. love seeing that, you know? But yeah, so I used to see Daniel down there. And those were the times, man. It was like early 90s. We we're little kids. Mm -hmm. My voice was definitely not this deep. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> and, you know You're what I'm saying? 12. It came, came a long way. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I got to the point of GCP on that turf that day, the man would say, yeah. And then a couple of men say, yo, I rap. I want to rap. Da, da, da. And back then, everyone's doing rap. We call it Buck, Buck and Flem. Everybody just dropping lines and just mm. talking shit. You know what I'm saying? And then a couple of men and were serious. Big up to Guilty. Big up to Showtime. You know, J-Rock. And, you know, everyone else after that just come with just trying to figure it out and trying to get serious. But yeah. on that album that you've seen, that's the turf. You know what I'm saying? So we just say, who I don't rap? We just, just go to the studio. I just pay for time in the studio. And be like, yo, here's for 20 hours. And then every every day, every couple of days, they say, yo, we're going to the studio. And then 15, 20 niggas that show up. And it would literally have the booth open. Niggas are jumping in there. When you listen to the album, you hear a man just rapping. And it's even just screaming in the background. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that's just yeah. in the background. All the man's rapping. You know it's what I'm saying? shit, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we just kind of did that. Um... What's homeboy's name? What's his name? Rory or something like that. I remember these these white these uh two white guys um ran the studio it was on uh Eglinton East there behind the jails and stuff. It was and then this little plaza. But yeah, so you know that was a dope time, mm -hmm. you know. And at, uh, James Stang, you know, I met him, and he's the one that produced all the beats. So during that time, I was meeting and connecting with people, and James Stang was a big a big part of that. You know, what I'm saying if we didn't yeah. have him, we would not have the production. And we wouldn't have the quality production that made us stand apart, that made us comparable mm -hmm. that, you know, to other groups that were coming from uh, the U.S. And it made us feel confident like we were the shit back then, you know, so we moved yeah. heavy like that. And you had a, you had a big crew. Yeah. And and even like, as like I seen that, right, because that was a dope ass fucking CD. I started seeing you separate from the pack. Like, even like the way I seen you separate from the pack, it wasn't like a slow thing. Like, I just... I seen a Guilty Crime production CD, right? Homie gave it to me in school. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, much music, Ayo, all that starts popping off, right? Yeah, so the time frame was probably like 2000 was the was the Turf's Hot. Mm -hmm. Came out with another follow-up. You know what I'm saying? It's probably 2002 or so. And then, you know, um, RIP Sketch Devious, he passed away. RIP. You know what I'm saying? Toba Chung passed away. You know what yes. I'm saying? And um. Things just changed up. Then, um, you know, everybody is going through different things. Remember, like I was saying before, a lot of men weren't like everyday rappers, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I was a rapper, you know what I'm saying? That grew up from a little picnic, you know what I'm saying? You know, my first rap we ever played on radio was what Mastermind when he was on Energy 108, bro. Wow. See? That's crazy. I was like 11, 12 years old, and S Blank said, yo, this guy Mastermind is doing this competition or some shit. He's trying to get a jingle for it. Mm -hmm. Here, write this rap, and then I'm going to put I'm gonna put it over this beat yeah. and then give it to him. And then they played it as a commercial, so it would play every time he would be on the radio. That's dope. See? And then that was on 107.9 when he was on TV. I'm oh, sorry, when he was on the radio. Those of you old enough to know, mm -hmm. know that that was a big deal, and that was the only place that hip-hop Played in Toronto well, back then. Shit. Like that's the only place where you can get the, your music is from the radio, right? Yeah. No, it was only then it was them and um uh DJ X of what I learned about afterwards when I was like I think 10, 11 years old, I found out that there was this thing called like the power, the power, the power move show. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, but I'm saying like that it wasn't like YouTube, radio, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, go on a streaming platform. Like, no, you yeah. can go on TV and you can go on the radio. And to do that, you have to be one of a million. Basically, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Literally, no, no, See, that, that's real yeah, shit. So, master, that was so that was my hype up. So, imagine that into going into you know 12 years old now. Now I'm already around S Blank because he recorded it for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So now just leading that down already in Flemmo. So onto the turf, Flemmo's mad talented, but a lot of talent, different talent, and you know I'm I'm, I'm very hungry. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So I just went full steam. Whoever was riding was right there, and we just kind of went in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a lot of support from everybody that was out there. And the cool thing about us on the turf, I remember the first time when when we even did like the first, like just a 
we didn't even know how to do shit. So we we're learning how to like register a business and do things like that. And we'd be like, yeah. it's on the turf, like, yo, anybody got control for the data for the whatever? <laughs> and like, man, we throwing in a hundred bucks, hundred bucks, whatever. You know what I'm saying? And that was, it was mad love. You know what I'm saying? Big mm-hmm. up the nuts, Lepke, you know what I'm saying? Different mans out there, Chills, Chiali, you know what I'm saying? RP, enough mans, like, you know, people were just kind of lending their support where they could because they know that we're trying to accomplish something. Yeah. You, right. You, and I was hungry. Yeah. And that you can, you or any of the man then like if, if it happens, you know, could rescue the whole hood basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know and this saying? is, the, and this is the, the, this is the birth of, of turf music or like, you know what I'm saying? Hoods in Canada. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So for all the men that's out there now listening to this, this is like, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, you're at the ages of our sons and shit now. Yeah, yeah. So this is when we're your age, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Basically. And that's, that's how we turn Toronto into this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's based off of our, you know, watching American hip hop and thinking that we're competitive with that. Mm. And it's the, the drug culture and just the, it's spilling into Canada. Yeah. And that, that just being like the, 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 it was like a rat race of making money basically on turf is like, get whatever you can and sell it to wherever you can. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To try and survive and make something so that you get more than what the government or somebody else is going to give you Mm -hmm. because it was hard for us to get into, you know, good job positions and different things like that. It would seem, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, no, that's real shit, man. And like, even like as somebody who you were starting, you're getting out, like you're getting on much music and stuff like that. Right. Like, yeah. As a young man, and this is pre Instagram. I'm gonna I'm gonna reiterate. Okay, now your face is visible. Okay, you're a turf guy. You're on the road, and all of a sudden, your videos on much music playing. You know what I'm saying? And people are seeing you. Are people hitting you up on road like, "Yo, you're JB." And when that's happening, what's that like for you as coming See, from the environment that you just came from? Yeah. So for me, I've always kind of. I had that experience after I started hitting much music and then traveling across the country and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's dope for me. Um, one thing, one thing that, I, um, that I learned though, is that it's very influential, right? So the same way, you know, that we grew up being influenced by other people mm-hmm. that turned us into who we, we are essentially, yeah. you know what I'm saying is and now I'm hearing a you in Vancouver say, yo, First time I was ever on the turf, da da da. I remember listening to like "What You Need" or something, da da da. And I asked the fiend "What You Need," and then I made my first twenty bucks, and it was on from there, da da da. Right? And I was like, I don't want to be responsible for that, my nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's a moral thing again because yeah. I got kids and everybody else, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell somebody to do that. Mm-hmm. No, I feel you, fam. That's you know crazy what I'm when to think to think about that, right? Yeah. But then to not know. We grew up in the crack epidemic mm. where it was around us. Like, man's had bricks and bushes. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I remember as a little kid walking around and it was like a movie to me as I'm walking to school or I'm walking to, to see one of my friends and guys are standing out there and they look like they run DMC or some shit or whatever. Yeah. And they just throwing you 20 bucks to go, you, you, man, go to McDonald's or something. You know what I'm saying? Keep the change. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it was a movie. So, yeah, it's, it's it's very it's, it's you know it's very uh, interesting, it influential. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, so you know we hope that you know what I'm saying that we influence the youths now to invest, do different things. You see all this property, different things that people are doing, businesses, invest in franchises. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I say franchises is a good thing because you don't have to be there or whatever. Yeah, you know a lot of people try to do entrepreneurial shit. That's in my blood. I do that shit. If other people you know, are smart. They'll just buy a business and just make it yeah. run itself. Open a Timmy's. You know what I'm saying? If yeah. you got the money for a Timmy's, you know what I'm saying? You might get a smaller little company now. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Try to do something, but you know, but do that. There's a lot of money floating around and there's there's a lot of opportunity now, you know? Mm-hmm. And even like you mentioned with, with the kids and stuff like that, at, at a young age, like salute to Kaka, right? Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Kaka, my my eldest son. Right. So how did that change things for you, having him at a young age? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's a documentary in itself. Like, you know, a kid having a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and then kind of like raising each other. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I'm a youth and now I'm at the age now where he's an adult and he tell, he's telling me shit like, like he's the adult that knows the shit. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I got to listen to him because 
I'm not that much older than him. Yeah. So he may know some shit that I don't know. I can't like son him like that. You yeah, know? y'all could put each other on the game. Yeah, you know, but it's it's, it's dope. But it, that was the eye opener, you know, seeing him get in trouble and knowing that there could be so much different and better things that he could be doing. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of using him as that example of saying, no, you don't have to do this. And there's different things. Yeah. Like one thing that I seen him do that I encourage most of the youth them out there is sometimes just having a job that you're not bound to have to answer your phone to go check nobody for no 20, 50 bucks on your hundred, hundred bucks. And then, you know, you own the next nigga sick, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. And then you just work in somewhere regular that, you know, you eat swallowing that pride because pride is only to, to the beholder where if your friends love you, they ain't gonna care what you're doing for work yeah. or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And if you work somewhere, you know, now you're going on vacations and all kinds of shit and having fun with your friends and doing stuff where you don't care. Yeah. You're not, you're not watching over your back. You're not worrying about losing something because all you got to do is go to work and make more money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then you get into a groove. And and that's when I started seeing this nigga go to, Bur- going to all the different islands, France, all these different places and stuff like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I would encourage a lot of you to do that. And again, I, 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 had, I had to teach him very very um like repetitively because you know the youths want to do what they want to do and obviously it's in the blood you want to be a star you want to shine you know what i'm saying you want to ball out whatever mm-hmm. but you got to be humble you know what i'm saying that's what we learned too late yeah is we got to be humble and you know make sure that we accomplish things that are sustainable that we could count on so that mm-hmm. we could so that we could acquire things that we could have for for the longevity, you know what I'm saying? For yeah, the long, for sure. For the future. And everything up until then is trying to sing or whatever, like having having money making one day because any money that's made, and this is real shit, everything that's ha- happening is based on somebody else's consumption right now. Mm. And if that person chooses to not consume, then you don't make money. Yeah. In the world of the streets. And that's going to be a hard lesson learned. And it's unfortunate that a lot of hustlers turn fiends. That too. And not even in, in terms of you doing the whatever, but now you're chasing it more than the fiends. The money. You're chasing the money more than the fiends are chasing the product. Yeah. Because it's not enough fiends for what it is, because fiends just want to change their life at some point. Yeah. And whatever it is, right? So, you know, think about things like that and just try to, you know, do things differently in your life that, you know, could have sustainability for your family. That it could acquire, that it could acquire security for your life. Mm-hmm. That you could have things that you could have, you know. Yeah, and that that comfort is is worth a million bucks as well, you know. Dope, dope, and and that's that's jewelry right there too, man. Yeah, JB's opened up the fucking jewelry store today. It's, it's bro. hard to swallow, you know what I'm saying? It's hard. It's easy to be cool, you know what I'm saying? Mm. It's hard to not be cool. Man, see me flip. Man, see me give them chicken and waffles when I want to open my chicken and waffle spot. Man, say, yo, go sit there and do it yourself. Anybody that I'm around that's a millionaire or whatever that's telling me, say, yo, do it yourself first so you know what it is, how the employees are supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. And swallow that. When you guys go buy your jewels, you think you're buying your jewels from a guy that's getting paid $15 an hour? (laughs) Come on, fam. Again, you're buying your jewels from a millionaire. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I'm saying or at least almost there you know what I'm saying you're buying your jewelry from a jeweler yeah the jeweler has millions of dollars worth of jewelry in your eye view yeah you know what I'm saying they swallow a certain pride yeah to give you that that confidence yeah you know what I'm saying make you feel like you're a million bucks when, in there, when you're then, in there you, but they the one with the million you bucks you know what I'm saying you're paying them for it <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's true, fam. Yo, fam, that, that's some real you know talk right there. So it's hilarious, right? So I learned to swallow pride, face humility, mm-hmm. and humble myself. Oh, I got to write that down. Swallow and, pride, face humility. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Swallow, yeah. My fr- swallow my pride, face humility, humble myself, and remember the end goal, which is my children and the, and the things that I want for them in the future. No, that's, that's real game right there. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk a few things that I feel like we discussed the last time on the show. Yeah. But because this is so deep in the catalog and because back then, like literally the audio that I used to record with was was one of these. Okay. okay. I used to put the phone in the middle of the table and that's with the audio. Yeah. So we used, to, the audios are trash from back then. Yeah. Not to say that the episodes weren't classic, but the audios were not the same now. Okay. And as you're getting some W's, moving along in the game, right? You get 
to this track, Fire in Your Eyes. See. Right? The track, crazy. Yeah. Video, well, th- there's a feature on it, the game. Yeah. But the video, no game. No game. Right? Also, I want to um, bring a little bit of hip hop history to this as well, okay? I'm listening to this. It might have been the California Republic or Confidential or whatever the name of the mixtape is. Yeah. I'm bumping the shit in the whip, doing my thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, like as one of the fans came and told you, I'm doing my thing, bumping, bumping this this mixtape in the whip, and I hear the fire in your eyes, and I'm like, oh, boom, 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 boom. This is the JB tune. But when I f- when the track finally finishes, I'm like, where the fuck is JB? But then you hear like one of the Black Wall Street guys. I just hear other niggas on it. I didn't even yeah. know who they were. I was just like, so this is the time in the concept. This is the time when people started rapping over other people's beats, Mm -hmm. like other industry beats. Yes. So game has this, obviously I own the masters. I own the song, everything to do with fire in your eyes. Yes. See, we paid him for the feature while we're on tour. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, um, but I didn't understand it. So them men that rapped over, but they took it a little step too far when they started like acting like it was a release, trying to get, gain popularity because they were nobody at the time. They're trying to mm-hmm. find their way. And it's still at this point, they're still not popular artists. Yeah. Or, you know, gained any really traction I don't think he fucks with it. them anymore like that. No, not at all. Yeah. But I still get paid for the song. And for some reason, they're still trying to use it like a, the like a mixtape single mm. is like a single. So that's all in whatever, whatever it is. Anyways, the beat is still a sample from Michael Jackson. So. Ain't nobody really getting paid There's from, only from so the much beat you side. Get, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But for the terms of publishing everything else, you know, that's all GCP recording club. But so, yeah, so that it was a little, it was a little shit move that those guys did. But shout out to Tony Martin, you know what I'm saying, for correcting that. And then, yeah, we got into that. We said that, you know, we, you know, them men that have not been here since then. You must have been fucking heated when you when because w- when did you find out? Right. Because we we I didn't have a podcast back then. I just knew you through or heard of you through the music. Right. I, yeah. I, I didn't even actually never even met you back in those, those days. Right. Yeah. I don't think. Right. Right. But somebody must have hit you up like, fam, you hear this shit right here? Yeah, I think it was somebody like that. And then it was like on like um, it was on like on a ringtone or some shit. Mm. So it was like it was like they're trying to get money from it or something. Wait a minute. Hold the fucking phone. You're telling me that they were selling it as a ringtone, your tune without you on it? So, yeah, that, that version that they did. me off now, bro. I'm getting right. pissed off back in, right. now in 2022. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I remember I just I called Tony, Tony Martin. And, yeah. you know, Tony worked, worked with henchmen and these guys at the time. And, and you know, he got Cicero on the phone and he told him, he told him that he can't use the song no more. Mm. And Cicero was just like, big homie said we can use it, I guess, you know, referring to game or whatever. Yeah. And then they, they squashed it. And I just told him, say, yo, just please make sure that shit is corrected. You know what I'm saying? And get something done. You know what I'm saying? And mm. uh, I think my homie Neil from Substance was trying to get him to come back into Canada for the Red Tour. Yeah. So we could get on stage together, perform the song together. And then he ended up getting stopped at the border again. But prior to that, you know, I was pretty pissed off still. And I, I probably said a lot of shit, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And they didn't come back to Canada until that attempt. And they didn't get in because of whatever gang shit that was happening. In yeah, the States yeah. And, did, and just last thing, just to wrap this game um, segment up, right? Did you ever have an opportunity after the fact to speak with him? Or was it just no, all never, through management? Yeah, I, I never, I never speak with him. Only like while we're on tour or whatever, I'd probably talk to him a couple times. Mm-hmm. Like after a show in the hotel or something in passing, I got, I was on the tour bus for a couple of cities with them. And, but after that, we never exchanged numbers, something like that, bro. Like <clears throat> we're so like, so heavy and just, we didn't care. Like those, like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It was like nothing. So that's one of the reasons why too he wasn't even in the video at the time while we were on tour before before we even recorded the song all he was shouting was fuck g unit fuck 50. Mm-hmm. at that time i wanted to get signed to g unit or death row yeah you know what i'm saying and 
we don't like burning bridges, me and my me and my friends that were around me. Yeah. Like in terms, especially for the business that we worked so hard to get to that level at yeah. that point. Yeah, right? and you're coming from Canada. It's a little bit harder too, fam. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't really care for whatever they're talking about. It was like more, it was more entertaining for us. Yeah. Right? Because I was, you know, there opening for him. So every, I, I'd bring him out on stage across the country. Mm-hmm. And then he would come on and say, fuck 50 or whatever. <laughs> Yo, bro. Right? So it was, it was hilarious. But, you know, so it was kind of like, do we bring him in or do we just kind of make it seem like it's a short film and nobody's performing the song? Mm-hmm. And it's just a short film, make it unique. And I like doing unique shit. Yeah. I'm one of the first people that did like the double, triple videos and stuff like that, tag mm-hmm. ons and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, with the with the first GCP ter- uh GCP um crime hits mega mix that was on much music mm-hmm, mm-hmm. from uh 99. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So but yeah, so I like doing different stuff. So we said we we decided, me and my homies decided that we'll do that, you know. And that's just the way it was. We told Cashmere, make it a short film type mm-hmm. style. Scoot the cashmere. With, with a tag on it. And mm-hmm. the tag was the We Run TO. And that's where I do the performance. And the performance would be the heavy, aggressive performance. Yeah. That would make up for anything missing. And us not having game look in the video is such a good look now. Because all of the different shit that he's been through up and down. And he's not like, you know, showed any looks or like, yeah. you know, trying to pick up nothing along the way anyways. And for our moral integrity... It was a good look for us. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it'll always be good to do work with the artist. Same thing with Nicole Ray. She wasn't in the video. She was supposed to come down. She was dating one of the guys from um, the the clips. Yeah, she's in Good in the Hood. Yeah. And she didn't want to come down because her boyfriend didn't want to, couldn't cross the border. That's crazy. So they, she, she got stopped, turned away at at the flight. She didn't want to come, keep on, continue on because... And it was one of the guys, you know, remember the guy that always wore the glasses, like the light skin guy that mm-hmm. was with Pusha T them? Yeah, yeah. I think she was dating that nigga. I can't remember his name. Um, not Sandman fam- or some shit. Sandman. It was Sandman. Was it Sandman? Yeah. They had family. They had Sandman. Yeah, and yeah. So I think it was crew. that nigga still. So she was dating him. He couldn't cross the border. Yeah. So she didn't want to come. So then Quinn Maybach, you know what I'm saying? I asked her, I said, yo, sing some, some backups on the song. Mm-hmm. And so you're technically on the song as a recording. Yeah. And please do the performance with me. You know what I'm saying? And then she she helped me out and, big, and did that for me. Big up, Quinn. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then the video, you know, was an amazing video from Cashmere. As, uh, as off, obviously, you know what I'm saying? It was a world-class video. Cashmere's goaded, yo. Yeah. Um, there's another person I want to ask you about um, who's a former artist of ours. Yeah. Or not artist of ours. Um, Former interview, former guest of ours. We Love Hip Hop alumni. Okay, Jazz Cartier. Yeah. You mentioned him earlier in the interview. Um, you said you 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 do some like you did some development behind the scenes with him and stuff. No, like- we GCP developed and made Jazz Cartier. Okay, so to See break it? that down to me, because like I, I feel that like you might have like a some kind of like where you feel that there was some kind of loose ends with him or something. Yeah. So right now I'm waiting for compensation mm. seen from Ivan and Universal okay seen and Jazz right we have our agreement Ivan called me when he took on Jazz for management on whatever they wanted to do with mm. him and asked me to just kind of leave them alone please and let them do the thing without any kind of input from my end okay you know what I'm saying to, that would that would stop anything or whatever You're right to let them do their thing and then, you know, they'll make sure that I'm taken care of in the end. Right. Right. So Jazz came to me from his father. You know what I'm saying? His father is from Flemo. Mm. See, and his father is, you know, one of the men them that, you know, I give respect to. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? His father called me, asked me, hey, can you, can you help my son become a rapper? He was just coming out of, still out of high school. Right. You know what I'm saying? And he was 16 at the time, probably 15. You know what I'm saying? So... I sat down with them, you know, on Eglinton West there, you know, you know, shout out to Butch because I still got lo- mad love for Butch. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I told him, sure, I'll take him under my wing. At that point, I had a lot of heavy rotation popper right now. It was right before I did I'm doing my thing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Would have been the last video. So I needed now I'm at the point I love kind of giving guys the baton, letting them run with it, see who got that fire. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I was, they were working with the GCP, with the rest of the team, with some of my other brothers, Young Jicks and those guys, and, um, you know, some of the guys from the park. 
Random Mac and everybody else. Shout out. And um, Bush hollered at me. So we sat down. And then Scotch Butter used to send me beats. Scotch mm-hmm. Butter is, is Jay Diggs' brother. Okay. See him? Look to Jay Diggs, yo. Director Diggs. Yeah, shout out to Director Diggs. You done know. And shout out to Scotch, too. You done know. Mm-hmm. I always look at those guys like they look, I, I feel like they're like my family. When I look at them, they look remind me of some cousins or some shit. And so I always had a good rapport with Scotch. He said, yo, I got this, this beat. He gave me the beat. I already had it, had the song on it. Her daddy don't like me because I'm from the hood. And we're developing jazz, you know, giving him beats from our producers and in-house producers, mm-hmm. Lance and these guys that came from my brother and some of the other producers that, you know, used to come to us and give us beats. You know what I'm saying? Um, Diesel used to give us beats. You know what I'm saying? Even Boy Wonder used to give us some beats. You know, Cardi, all kinds of people, jazz would get some beats off of, you know, some early online beats. Yeah. Cooking Soul, stuff like that was. So <clears throat> we brought him into the studios. I, you know, I took him under my wing. I gave him that song. I said, yo, this is perfect for you. He's saying her daddy don't like me. Mm. So write about it like, you know, like you're a you just and the, the, the girl's dad don't like you. Yeah. So we made the song. I put the verse on it as well as the feature verse for it. Scotch has the hook. Scotch wasn't in the video. Mm-hmm. But um, I got the grant for that video for him through GCP Productions. And um, we had a lot of support through my relationships to make sure that video was number one video in Canada. Mm-hmm. And that's what it did. You know what I'm saying? It beat out a lot of videos and it sparked a, it sparked a great energy yeah. for the youths because in the video, it was like a private school. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. all the Forest Hill youths, all the rich youths, them loved the song. The song was dope too. And you could go find that on Spotify, you know what I'm saying? And find a video on YouTube, Her Daddy Her Daddy Don't Like Me, Jazz Cartier featuring JB. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You'll see it, GCP Record Corp, all of that. Mm-hmm. And the plan was to launch his album, get a couple more videos popping, like how I do for my own thing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but invest a little bit more into it because that had the fuel for the for the youth. Yeah. I was approached by a couple people from the States because his his mother was uh married to some um to some uh military guys out in the and a military guy out in the state so he was always traveling mm-hmm. like a military kid scene and um he's old he was a military private school kid anyway yeah. so he was always traveling so he was never here but when he was here we put him to work put him as a feature and some of the other artists that we work with from LA the Ville other guys that we were working with at the time and the plan was to launch him and make him the biggest star in Canada, mm-hmm. which he became eventually. Yeah. Anyways, because he was because Ivan and those guys seen the seen the vision, and I just want my just do. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. everyone's just kind of playing like you know, playing games. You know what I'm saying? Just acting like they forgot who put them on, mm-hmm. who allowed them to sleep in the studios, and do whatever they want, a free reign. You know what I'm saying? At my yeah. expense. At my expense of my family not having me there and my time not being dedicated to my own children yeah. because I'm raising, you know, another Canadian star. You know what I'm saying? And that's basically what I was doing, picking them up, dropping them off. So it wasn't like, you know, uh, a youth that's saying, yeah, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to go to the studio or whatever. You got his little crew. Like, no, literally, like, I'm doing all the work. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So if it was just some kind of handoff or a little like, yo, I think this kid is hot type of thing. You know what I'm saying? You should just work with him. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be nothing for me, but I put a lot of effort and, and shit into that. Help I hear him doing interviews up. and I don't get my credit. Mm-hmm. And it's, I don't know if it's a flemmo thing or just me. I do a lot in this industry that I don't get credit for. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's because I come from an aggressive place that intimidate a lot of people yeah. in the industry that, you know, unfortunately, you know, did what it did, but that's not the case now. And you can't erase history. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I just want my just do. I want these guys to just, just honor the thing. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, if we're yeah. in the States, it'll be a totally different story, any other country. You know what I'm saying? But in Canada, everyone just kind of act like they're blind, deaf, and dumb mm-hmm. all of a sudden after finding out that they get some money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and yeah. For layman's terms, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like a man, you giving a man work, you giving him the fiends. You know what I'm saying? They making some money and then they just go friggin' start copping off of a next fucking boy and the next dude mm-hmm. and forgetting that all the work that you put in invested into them for making them make money, still using your fiends, but take taking work from another person. You know yeah, what I'm saying? That's that would have me pissed. 
Right. So it's just kind of like, I just want my just do. I just want people to honor their good business because I did what I needed to do to, to make him one of Canada's stars. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I put him on a platform. We made his video number one across Canada. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we put him on, on a, we catapulted him, catapulted him into, into the atmosphere of, into the stars. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For him to be visible for anyone to want to see or fuck with him, you know? And that's just, that's his business. You know what I'm saying? We did a lot of shit coming up, you know. As a first person, put Blessed on an album back in the day. Shout okay. out to Blessed. Salute to Blessed. You know, I put him yeah. on an album with my homie Demolition, man. Okay. You know, the first, you know, their first reggae albums, you know, and then you can find that it's all GCP shit too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They're all big enough GCP. That's know? crazy. So the, yeah, the GCP um, imprint has been like behind a lot of things in the scene around here. Yeah. 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 You know, and I made sure it was attached to a lot of things. Like you see the, the documentaries, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? For the, for the, for the neighborhoods. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And from a lot of different things. So uh, we launched American Idol singers come in here mm -hmm. just for distribution and stuff like that. He's have some really good distribution deals. Yeah. And, you know, just doing different kind of business. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So I got a last couple of questions for you just that are just more general in the game, right? Yeah. Um, like back in the days we had gatekeepers, okay? The yeah. labels, the different things that we needed to have to get attention or even just get out there, right? Get published. Yeah. Right? But now we have social media and different things going on, right? That, um, yeah. you know, we could just upload and direct to the consumer, right? Do you think that there's still gatekeepers now? So there are always going to be gatekeepers because... Until they turn the TV off and there's no broadcasting actual television shows that are made mm -hmm. or like the only thing is like news or something, there's always going to have to be content made. Yeah. And content for TV and content for radio, the same as TV, has to be, you know what I'm saying, from stars. Mm. Those are household names at that point. And that's the difference between now and then is that if I don't follow you, I don't know you. Yeah. But- if I'm on TV, you know me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the difference. I've been on TV. All of my videos are heavy rotation on mm -hmm. TV. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All of you guys are youths or picnies or, you know what I'm saying? Or your parents were bumping off of my shit because it was the only thing on TV with all of the other stars. Yeah. If it was Britney, whatever. If it was Jay-Z, whoever it was. There is only a small space for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we had to make sure that we were savvy as fuck to get that space. Yeah. <clears throat> to get that rotation. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we were on TV. So that's one thing with me that's different that I kind of not care about social media as much, but I try to stay engaged. But I've been on TV. I'm on radio. So I know how to do that. Yeah. When I want to, when I want to do something, cause I'll still do music in my life, but it'll be endless, timeless music that has no, timestamp on it where yeah. it's made for social media or a trend it's just made for tv or radio mm. that is the music of your life forever yeah you know what i'm saying because music and music on tv and radio they play songs that you listen to no matter what age we are that are from decades ago mainstream you know what i'm saying and my songs a my songs a yo probably ready or not still play today on the radio in toronto now yeah you know what i'm saying and Shout out to them and keep on requesting it. Please keep on playing it yeah. because that's relevant. Those are things that relevant in people's, in people's lives. You know what I'm saying? It's because it was a part of our soundtrack of our life. Those mm. things that played on the radio or that we've seen on the TV. I used to call it the trifecta. You know what I'm saying? Say, yo, you're going to hear my song playing on the radio. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go home, see the video. You know what I'm saying? And then you're going to see me one other place. If it's a magazine, if it's somewhere else, you know yeah. what I'm saying? See see something else, you know? And then that's what's going to make you know me for life now. That's the difference between social media. Yeah. You don't know these people unless you follow them, one. And then you got to actually engage. And if the algorithm even spits you out to them. Yeah. So there's so much in, in the, into play, you know? But yeah, so it's a little bit different. But I would still say, you know, when we talk, when we have budgets, like, you know, for Kaka, in America, like I have this, there's this one song I was like, yo, this song, like, this would be sick. Like he's singing on it. I'm like, yo, well, imagine we could get Chris Brown on it, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not far fetched. But then, okay, so what's the budget? Because it has to be on radio. We can't post this on fucking social media. Yeah. This has to be playing on everybody's radio and be played on the videos or wherever videos get played. Get added into the so, um, playlist. Exactly. So mm -hmm. then we know it's a quarter million dollars now. 
You know what I'm saying? In Canada, we say it's a bit different. It's easier for me to do it in Canada. I don't have to spend money going across every 50 different states. I just go call the homies at Flow, call the homies at whatever other stations there are, which is like 10 in the whole country. Yeah. I say, yo, run my shit. You know what I'm saying? And then give them a reason to or not. And yeah. then find out what I need to do to make it better so that they run it. And that's the point that I got to. I always ask. That's what people respect my music. And always played it because I always brought them industry standard music. Mm. Even if sometime I'm dumbing down my shit or just talking simple flows and shit, it's because I know that's what they wanted that they would put in the rotation yeah. in that time for a soundtrack of a lot of people's lives at that moment. Yeah. It's yeah. the only thing getting played on TV or getting heard on the radio. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That's the word I was looking for, not playlist rotation, getting yeah. put into the rotation is. Yeah, once yeah. you're in the rotation, like the, yeah. the top 40 and all that, you're, you're, you're gravy yeah. trained. So for the youth that's making the music now, like all the Toronto youth still aim for that. Mm -hmm. Like I've been fortunate. I've been, I've been one of the only people that even heard one of Tizzy's songs on the radio, like on BLK. Yeah. Because I was just listening to BLK one day. I got it, the reception. I was like, oh shit, BLK, they're playing a mix show and they're running this shit. That's crazy. And I took a video, I sent it to, to my, to my homie. And they didn't even know because it's not playing in Toronto. So how would he know he's playing on radio? Yeah. That's crazy. And he's, he's, he's receiving royalty points because like he's you know hooked up to whatever, even if it's to TuneCore. If it's going to get a radio yeah. play, you're going to get, TuneCore will track it. And it's a different level now of popularity. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because it's not for everybody. And people didn't have to search for it. Right. It's not for everybody. Yeah. It's a force-fed Here's what music is. Yeah. If you don't have nothing in your life, no techno, whatever, or you just need to know what's popping in the city, which most people listen to the radio at a certain point sometimes, and this is what's getting played. And it's a big deal. So some of you try, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. While you're doing everything else, make it a point because then that's where you are getting paid. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And when you get paid money from much music spins, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You're getting, you're getting fractions of monies of, of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars split between whatever artists are getting played at that, that quarter. Yeah. Which is not a lot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So if you're one of the 15 or one of the 50 people splitting a few million dollars, that ain't a bad thing. That's, that's, that's money in the, in the bank right there. Every quarter. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. there's things that a lot of people don't know business-wise, and that's why I had the structure of GCP Recording Corp. A lot of niggas don't need to know. I don't want to care. Mm. about knowing so you don't just don't even worry about it just have a fair percentage and have someone else run the shit so that it could actually get out there yeah or else it's going to be just rapping to yourself and your homies forever yeah and we want the music out there we want all of that music out there to for people to hear it but as you see in america everybody benefit from from somebody has to benefit from somebody yeah so we all need to eat in order for us to do our job in order for us to help each other so everyone got to break bread with each other. So we can't be selfish. You know what I'm saying? Because 100% and a zero is still zero. Everybody eat, B, like, like, like Diddy says, yo. Last question I have for you. Yo. And this is my, uh, I'm, I'm making it run as my the Friday Ricky Dread question. Yeah. Um, one second here. Fucking fly. As a man who has been through a lot of things, right? You're a vet, right? You've learned a lot. What's one thing that you wish you knew then that you know now? Invest and save. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And just, just do that. Invest and save. Invest you know? and save. And then have, have a plan. I learned late to have a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, and it forced me. And I didn't even know how to make a plan. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it forced me. And I remember... Um, somebody was just in school or knew how to do this shit. And I remember I just paid them to do the plan for me for like one of my businesses. Mm -hmm. and I was fortunate to have that, but that is a big key for success because it's a plan and everything is written out and planned out for you. Yeah. And every step. So even if it's not going a certain way, you have a plan and how to correct that and how to offset that so that you could stay focused on success. You know what I'm saying? And mm. it, our comment, we, we could talk about so much more and maybe we should have like different, you know, I'm hoping to do different things. Cause one thing I really want to touch on that nobody touches on mm -hmm. is family court. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And custody battles between men and women. Yeah. 
Well, that, like that was a, you know, we can get into um, something that's been going on in the news. Um, Marquise um, um, Jackson. AK, 50s kid? 50s kid, right? Yeah. He went, he was been going off. He went on social media. He was like 50s only hitting us with six G's a month or hitting me with six G's a month. And he was complaining. But then the people, like the, the comments were getting at him because they were like, six G's a month is all right still. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, come on, fam. Because everyone is always going to assume somebody's making something, but you don't know. Yeah. So you know? like, that's a conflict where 50s already, you know, he yeah. dealt with that in court, right? Yeah. So like, let's get into it. Yeah, well, you know, some people, are, I guess, are used to this season to this. Some people are new and frustrated and it feels like the world is ending for them, you know? Mm -hmm. And there needs to be some kind of um, education for fathers, especially, you know, single fathers, if you're not with a woman to begin with, just to know how to prepare yourself yeah. and even have things set up ahead of time so you're not hit with it later on in life, you know? So at least you're planning your future with those intentions, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're hit with it off guard, it's, it's bad, you know. And then when it comes to like court battles and different things with kids, mothers and men that may be frustrated, don't know how to deal with it. It gets super frustrating. And, you know, it's like people can get into a dark place. You yeah. know, I've been through a couple battles. It's crazy, bro. I feel like I've been on love and hip hop without the t without the TV crew following me. Damn. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I give it one thing I understand through it all. And I have two baby mothers using the same lawyer. You know what I'm saying? What? You know what I'm saying? One after the other, two consistent court battles for four years straight now. You know what I'm saying? And that's just to be able to see my kids properly, which they all know that, you know, I love and want to see my kids all the time. Mm -hmm. so, you know, now, but you know, one thing I will give to them is that, you know, maybe I may have not been the best person and a lot of people have to own up to that. Yeah. You know, so I'll give you, I'll be transparent and, and give you my honesty in all of that. You know, through it all, I haven't seen a couple of kids, you know what I'm saying? And mm. some years now, you know what I'm saying? And then some a couple years. of years, years, bro. And a couple of the youth, the, some of the young ones now have just now started to get around me. Right. So it's hard, but we need people to advocate for men to be able to get through these things and have tools and support. Mm. And I'm sure there are, but not really for young guys out the hood or whatever, or guys that may be, you know, trying to be entertainers and, you know, baby mothers might see them with jewelry and think they got money or whatever and this yeah. and that now. And, you know, one thing that you always have to remember is that the mother of your children deserve everything that, you know, your child deserves. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because they're watching and they're they're taking care of your child. And you want your child to have the best, you know what I'm saying, um, quality of life. And I would say a lot of men out there need to hear, you know, find good lawyers, obviously, mm. you know, and just do what you need to do in order to support your children. It's hard. But don't give up. You know, a lot of people give up and say, fuck it, whatever, whatever. And then other things will happen. But stay true to your kids and always just try to, you know, do the best that you can. You know what I'm saying? And that's me. I've always had these thoughts. Like, I, I, I was like, nobody ever told me nothing to do about none of this. My father, nobody. I don't know even who, no people who's deal with. Obviously, it's something that people deal with. A lot of people that are rich to this pay a lawyer yeah. to deal with it. But what if you don't have a lot of money and you have to actually deal with and you got to provide all these documents and then it'll feel like, you know, you're being probed. You know what I'm saying? It gets very frustrating. But, mm -hmm. you know, as long as you can kind of keep your cool and, you know, communicate, find proper representation, you know, and just do the best what you can. Remember that it's your kids at the end of the day. Mm. And any time with them, what you know, is going to be worth a lot. You know what I'm saying? And we could get more into this another time or whatever, but it'd be great to just kind of hear other people's situations and have some kind of source or some kind of support system for a lot of the people that's going through all of that. Because there's a lot of people dealing with all of that shit now. And they're by themselves, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And everyone thinks that they're alone when they're dealing with it. You know? No, no, you're never alone when it comes to that type of stuff. And the thing is, you know, um, a lot of people, especially as us black men, different guys who come from the hood and stuff like that, um, we don't really express ourselves a lot to, to to people. We try to hold it inside. You know yeah. what I mean? We up and all that shit. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? No, it's real talk, but we, we need to do um, 
we need to do multiple parts where you come in and just drop jewels on the people, damn fam. Yeah, if you want to do something like that, because this is going to be a long and conversation wise, you know. But you know, that would be a whole other podcast, yeah, you and know that's what I'm some, and that's stuff that like I feel needs the proper attention. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But I feel that we covered a lot of ground in this interview here, right? We got to to know about the businesses that you've been dealing with, um, your upbringing, like finally a full story to find out the man that you are now and how that became to be. You know what I'm saying? And I See? and I appreciate you sharing this this, this in, with me. Yeah, you know respect, bro. Um, I want you to give the people beside your social media platforms anywhere where you can find your businesses and like, anywhere you want people to find like anything that's going on with you. Yeah, so again, you know, Homer's Premium Lager, mm -hmm. available in the LCBOs across Ontario, wherever it's sold. You know, it, it is a struggle getting LCBOs to carry the beer because there's a lot of different brands that are competing for shelf space yes. every single day. You know what I'm saying? But we are available downtown core. You can check St. Lawrence Market Square. Check LCBO.com for all the other locations. Some of these, uh, Scarborough, there's a couple. You know what I'm saying? Out West, Kitchener. You know, check out, look out for Zan Cannabis, wherever you see it. We're trying to, you know, make that a, a, a dope cannabis spot. You know, it's coming from people that know about cannabis, I grow cannabis, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, mm -hmm. I smoke a lot of weed and we know what's popping out here so we could curate the smoking experience for people properly in the stores, you know? So just trust in that. Look out for Zen Cannabis, uh, zencan.ca. You know, look out for uh, for me, anything that I'm doing, I might be dropping some new music, you know, um, some big, big stuff though, you know, it's like, international sounding type shit. Yes, sir. With multiple features, different things like that. Um, I'm always at JB's Music. And you can go check out some of the old videos on YouTube at JB's World. You know what I'm saying? JBZ World on YouTube. You can find some of the videos, check them out. You know, and um, yeah, go request some of those so, some of those songs like Ayo on uh, Flow 98.7. And uh, shout out to everyone that's been still supporting all the music and everything that I've been doing. Shout out to, you know, Friday, Ricky Dredd, the whole Thank We you, Love Hip Hop team. Mad love for y'all. And we have so much to cover, man. There's so much that we want to educate the youth. You know what I'm saying? Help to encourage different businesses, different business ideas, practices, you know, how to do things, how to get things accomplished. You know what I'm saying? That they're not going to teach you that. Hopefully that they are now, but not everyone's on in Remix Project or in different things that, you know, you still got to acquire, you know, uh, a subscription or, you know, um, a membership or whatever, right? So we mm -hmm. want everyone to kind of know these jewels so we could change the narrative. So, yeah, so the one thing that Michael Cotto, my homie, told me, you know, when we we're speaking is that imagine if all the rappers were only talking about buying houses, being doctors and being lawyers and having the most wealth from all the big businesses that you could acquire yeah. rather than shooting, killing and selling drugs. You know what I'm saying? Imagine what our society would be now with all of us, because now we know that we kings, queens and we have, you know, intelligence be far beyond our wildest imagination. So imagine if we would have impl implemented this from years ago. You know what I'm saying? I'm supposed to have buildings. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Own condominium, not condos, condominiums. You know what I'm saying? Like Tridel is supposed to be mandem. Like we all supposed to be sandals. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, like them mandem. You know what I'm saying? Resorts, different things. You know what I'm saying? So think about that type of shit. Because when you're coming up early, it's easy to get. You know what I'm saying? You just need to just focus and get the information on how to do it. That's all at your fingertips now with technology. Bless up your donuts, your nigga JB. Every time. Shout out to Kaka. Shout out to Nails by Nine. Shout out to everybody out there. Shout out to all my kids. You know what I'm saying? I love y'all. Y'all the coolest motherfuckers in my in the world to me. You know what I'm saying? And shout out to Sila and Zeke. You don't know. Xavier, Olivia, and Destin as well. And Prince. Producer Prince. You don't know. Shout out. Don't Seeing know. those are all my kids. Shout out. Mad love to everybody else. Bless I don't know. Let yeah. me run some tune here. Hold on. Hey. I, I found it. Shout out to Herx, yo. Well, yeah, glad. PK Herx. <laughs> yeah. Salute to PK Herx. Yeah. I found the tune. Yeah. yeah. Original version. JB. 